Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to today's Ask the Expert webinar on OJ, TOFSIMS, and XPS. Our experts for today are Jurgen Schur, Principal Scientist in OJ, Sachin Atavar, Senior Scientist in TOFSIMS, and Sasha Radiansky, Principal Science, Scientist in XPS. My name is Rena Samsu, and I am the Senior Marketing Manager assisting with today's event. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees have been muted. However, if you have additional questions that pop up during the presentation, please submit them in the question section located in the bottom of your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Time permitting, we will answer these questions during today's event, or we will follow up with you in the coming week. With the abundance of questions submitted for today's event, we unfortunately will not be able to get all of the pre-submitted questions during the presentation. For any unanswered questions, the team will send answers out to those questions soon. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. Now I will turn it over to Lori Lavagne, Manager of Surf and Science, who will be moderating today's presentation. Lori? Thank you, Rena. And thank you everyone for attending today's presentation of Ask the Expert. We'll be covering questions submitted about three of the most surface sensitive techniques, OJ, TOF SIMS, and XPS. Our presenters today include Sachin Adabar, who has over 15 years of surface analysis experience, most recently in TOF SIMS, Sasha Radnyansky, who has over 36 years of surface analysis experience with 28 most recently in XPS, Jurgen Scherer, over 33 years of experience, most recently focused in OJ, and I'm Lori Lavagne, and I've been, have over 38 years of experience focused in OJ, SEM, and EDX. So between the four of us, we have over 120 years of experience, so hopefully we can provide some comprehensive answers to the questions that you have. So for today's agenda, I'll start with an introduction to Eurofins and Eurofins EAG. I'll go over our smart chart that's an overview of our techniques. Then we'll begin questions and answers for each of the techniques. Finally, we'll have an open Q&A at the end to address additional questions submitted during today's webinar and then a summary. Our parent company is Eurofins, and it's a global leader in testing with more than 58,000 employees, 900 laboratories in 54 countries. Eurofins EAG is a division of Eurofins and specializes in materials testing, and EAG has been around for over 40 years. We have more than 1,000 employees in 20 laboratory facilities all over the world. We have more than 2,500 different types of testing equipment and support over 5,000 clients. So let's start by taking a look at the SMART chart. SMART is an acronym for Spectroscopy Microscopy Analytical Resolution Tool, and it shows the techniques that we have here at EAG. It, this chart allows us to compare spot size and detection limit for each technique. So the techniques are color-coded according to the descriptions in the key at the lower left. For example, dark blue areas provide elemental information primarily, while green shows imaging information. The x-axis shows the range of spot sizes from one centimeter at the right down to one angstrom at the far left. The y-axis shows concentrations either in atoms per cubic centimeter at the left or an atomic concentration at the right that range from 100% at the top down to 10 parts per trillion at the bottom. So within this box, you can select your technique based on the detection limit that you need and the size of your analysis area of interest. Outside of the box are techniques that don't quite belong in the chart. So the techniques on the right, for example, don't necessarily have a spot size associated with them. They're basically bulk composition techniques and that may consume your entire sample and they have detection ranges shown as from top to bottom. The techniques at the bottom are basically imaging techniques and don't provide composition per se, but they do have relevance with respect to the spot size on the x-axis.
So highlighted are the three bubbles from the techniques that we'll be talking about today. So one of the main strengths of OJ is its spatial resolution. One of the main strengths of TOF SIMS is its detection limit. And XPS or ESCA is the workhorse having both a reasonable spot size, a good detection limit, and being able to give elemental and organic information. So this chart shows depth of analysis. TOF SIMS has a very shallow sampling depth of only one nanometer. XPS and OJ analysis depths are about five to 10 nanometers. These are surface techniques that are up to a thousand times shallower than some of the other routinely used anal analytical techniques such as FTIR and SEMEDS. So this means that very thin films or contaminants can be detected on a sample by TOF, XPS, and OJ that may be missed by other techniques. The arrows indicate that deeper depths are available in some techniques by depth profiling. And depth profiling is the removal of sample material by ion beam sputtering. Also note that the three techniques we're talking about today are performed under ultra high vacuum down to 10 to the minus 10 tor. So let's get started with OJ and our first presenter, Dr. Jurgen Scherer. Thanks, Lori, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will try to address some of the questions that came in uh, regarding OJ. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at the bubble chart again here to see where uh, OJ is located. So OJ covers spot size ranges from 10 nanometers to about a millimeter and the concentration range from below one atomic percent to 100%. Many of the questions that came in were actually very general in nature, like what is OJ, how does it work, what can it do? Uh, but before I go into more detail on this, uh, let's briefly talk about why it's called OJ. It's not named after this, this is an auger. It's also not named after that, which is OJ. It's named after this guy, this is Pierre OJ, a uh, French scientist who in the 1920s discovered a three electron process now called the OJ process that the technique that we refer to as OJ is based on. The technique is actually called OJ electron spectroscopy, but it seems to be too many words, so it's called OJ for short. So let's take a look at how the OJ process works. We bombard the surface with electrons and different interactions happen here, but what we're interested in is ionization, this one. So that leaves the atom in an excited state with a vacancy that can be filled by an electron from a higher shell. And that can happen in one or two ways. It can happen with the emission of a photon, or it can happen with the transfer of energy to a third electron, which then can leave the solid. So that's the OG electron we're interested in. Now, if you look at this diagram, you might already be able to tell that the kinetic energy of this OG electron here is determined by the energies of the electrons in the atom that participated in this transition. And these are specific to the element. So by measuring the kinetic energy of the OG electrons, it's possible to determine which element emitted it. So that's the underlying principle. So how do we measure the kinetic energies? We need to measure a spectrum. It looks something like this. This is actually the same spectrum, just displayed two different ways. And what we see here is there's a bunch of peaks in the spectrum. Um, and each of these peaks corresponds to OG electrons emitted from a different element. So for example, if we see a peak at 275 eV, then we know that came from carbon. So by just identifying the peak positions, we can determine what elements are present in the surface that we're analyzing. In addition, by scaling the intensities with uh, the sensitivity factors that are provided by the instrument manufacturer, we can uh, provide a, a, a fairly decent uh, estimate of the surface composition of the volume that we're analyzing. So that's a quick rundown on how OJ works. The next set of questions were a little more specific, like what are the advantages of using OJ? Because there are other techniques out there that seem to be doing similar things. How is OJ different from other techniques, in particular EDS? Can it only measure the surface or can we also analyze in depth? And how is the depth calculated? 
To answer these questions, let's first look at the interaction volume between the electron beam and the sample. So the electron beam is coming in here from the top and it's penetrating down to a depth of uh, say one to two microns. And this excitation volume is actually the same as an EDS. In EDS, all the information is coming from this entire volume, which is a large volume. So uh, that's basically what gives EDS a fairly poor surface sensitivity. In OJ, however, all the information is coming from a very shallow layer at the very surface here, indicated in yellow. The width of this, um, it's basically a disc-shaped volume, the, the width of this volume is determined by the beam size. And beam sizes can be as low as uh, 10 nanometers in OJ. So OJ has a very high spatial resolution, which means it's suitable for looking at small things. The, the thickness of this disk or the sampling depth is determined by the inelastic mean free path of the OJ electrons, typically in the three to 10 nanometer range. This is what gives OJ a very high surface sensitivity. So we can analyze the composition on the very surface of a sample uh, or the composition of thin features that are sitting on top of uh, the surface. So these are the two main advantages of OJ, high spatial resolution and high surface sensitivity that distinguish OJ from other techniques, in particular EDS. With regard to the question whether we can analyze in greater depth, um, there, there's no way of tweaking the OJ process in a way that would allow us to look deeper into the sample, the way it is in EDS, where you increase the beam voltage and then you can look deeper. Uh, the way it works in OJ is we combine OJ basically with um, ion beam sputtering. So we have an ion beam that uh, removes a certain amount of material, and then we just measure again at that depth. That so could be, let's say, 50 angstroms in. Then we do this again. Now we're, let's say, 100 angstroms in, and we take data again, and so on, until we reach the depth that we want to get to. So this depth could be a micron, sometimes more. Most of the time, it's less than that. And then this this data can then be displayed uh, in the form of what's called a depth profile. And uh, this would show either intensity or concentration as a function of sputter time or sputter depth. And uh, so what it shows is basically how the concentrations or intensities of each element vary as a function of depth. We can learn, for example, here there's uh, carbon on the surface, um, then we have an oxide layer that's uh, about 35 angstroms thick, and we can look at what the chrome to iron ratio does here on the surface. This, by the way, is electropolished stainless steel, so we're looking for um, a high chrome to iron ratio. That's something we can, information we can extract uh, from this profile. One question that came up in this context was, well, how, how do you actually know what depth you're sampling here? And um, so initially, we're basically measuring the intensities and concentrations as a function of sputter time. So to get from sputter time to sputter depth, we need the sputter rate, how much material we remove per minute. And that's usually measured on silicon oxide and then applied to that profile. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that every material sputters at a different rate. So if you have a material that sputters at the same rate as silicon oxide, then the depth scale is pretty accurate. Um, if it sputters at a different rate, that could be a uh, quite substantial uh, systematic error. It could be a factor of two potentially. The way to remedy this would be to measure the sputter rate on uh, a material of the same composition that we're analyzing here. Then the depth scale will be very accurate. If it's primarily the depth you're interested in and not so much the concentration, just one little, how, how thick is this oxide or how thick is a, a layer in a multi-layer stack? stack. The, the best way to do that still is to do with an imaging technique, basically cross-sectioning a sample and uh, take a cross-sectional image and measure it on the image. The next set, next set of questions are, uh, what can OJ be used for? What are typical applications and how do you locate small features? Now, the, the depth profile that I just showed a minute ago, this is actually one of uh, the, one, uh, it's a very common application in OJ, basically depth profiling, um, electropolished stainless steel uh, to measure the, the thickness of the passivation layer. 
This does not require um, high spatial resolution, but it still requires high surface sensitivity for the profile. An application that requires both high spatial resolution and high surface sensitivity is particle analysis on whole wafers. So the scenario is that we get a wafer from a client that has defects on them and they want to know what they are. So typically this wafer would be scanned in an optical detection tool that provides coordinates and estimated size of the defects. And we get a map that shows us where these defects are. And these, uh, this map or the data can be imported into our uh, whole wafer OJ tools. And then we can navigate to whatever defect we want to go to, just click on it and it goes to the defect, we can take an image, then we can take a survey spectrum that tells us what the defect is made of. So in this case, we have a sub 50 nanometer kind of spherical particle and the OJ tells us this is a carbon particle. So one question that came up in this context was, well, can you do this if you do not have a full wafer OJ instrument? And I would say if the wafer is a patterned wafer, then it's still pretty straightforward because you could cleave the wafer and use the die corners as reference points. If it's a bare wafer or just a blanket film on a wafer, um, I would say it's, um, it's fairly hopeless to find specific defects. So I can only advise against doing it. I think that should really be done on a full wafer OJ instrument unless the wafer can be marked in some way before the, the defects come on and before the wafer is cleaved. And, and by the way, this is actually marking, marking defects is actually something we do on this instrument too for the purpose of uh, making it possible for other techniques to find defects. So let's say, for example, some of the defects on a wafer are organic in nature, and maybe they should go to tough sims, or a defect is too small for OJ or buried on, under the surface and should go to TM. So what we do in these cases is we'll find the defect in the full wafer OJ tool and then uh, mark the individual defects. And then the wafer comes out, we cleave the wafer and send a coupon to whatever technique needs to take a look at that next. So it's a little side feature that this, um, this piece of equipment can provide. Here's an uh, application that mainly relies on the high surface sensitivity. So we have a thin flake or residue sitting on top of tinitride coated metal lines. And you can tell the defect is really thin because the SEM is literally looking through it. Now, with OG, would come in and take a spectrum on the defect and on a, in a control area. And what we see in the control area, it's the green, spe uh, green spectrum. We see it's tinitride, so the cap uh, on, on the metal line. And uh, on the defect, we see primarily um, aluminum and oxygen. So even though the defect is so thin that the SEM is looking through it, uh, the, the high surface sensitivity of OJ can, allows us to actually analyze the composition of this flake uh, without interference from the tinitride underneath. And so the conclusion is then basically made by comparison, by comparing these two spectra or by displaying the information in the form of a map, which is shown in the lower left, which is basically an image that shows the elemental distribution of the elements detected. Um, so that, that the image itself tells the whole story. Management kind of likes these kind of things. So I have one more uh, application here, and that's nitinol stents. So there are a bunch of things that can be done with uh, nitinol stents. We could look at contamination, for example. Um, if there's any discoloration, we can identify that, or we can look for nickel segregation, which is uh, a big no-no. And that can be done on a large scale. So we could, for example, analyze over this large area here or along the strut, um, or look at this little feature here at the end. So um, whatever is accessible to the, to the OJ beam. And that would typically be done with a survey spectrum, which is shown here in the middle. We see dioxide, which is expected, but we also do see some nickel. We see some other contamination like uh, potassium and sulfur. I would say the main application for nitinol is actually depth profiling, which is shown here on the right, um, primarily to measure the thickness of uh, the oxide layer. So we we'll look at at which depth the oxygen concentration drops by 50%. And um, this is a measurement that's often required for FDA approval. So in summary, OJ has high surface sensitivity, small spot size, and provides good depth resolution. 
Limitations are that for best quantification, we require standards. Insulators can be difficult and um, samples must be vacuum compatible. And with this, I'll turn it over to Sachin to talk about uh, tough SIMs. Thank you, Jürgen. So for this section, I'll be talking about TOF-SIMS. tof stands for Time of Flight Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometry. So here, you look at some of the... So we'll visit the smart chat again, just to revise where TOFSIMS, I mean, the major strength of TOFSIMS is its sensitivity, I mean, detection limits. It's much lower than OJ and XPS, and as can analyze a fairly small sample to a larger sample. I mean, it has a good range of analytical size. So, Main set of questions were, what is TOFSIMS? I mean, kind of the general questions about the technique. I mean, so my next slide, I'll be talking about the basics of TOFSIMS. So here we have a sample sitting in a vacuum chamber and a pulse primary ion beam comes in its surface and generates secondary ions. And these are the ions that are sent to the detectors. So during the process, both it generated positive ions and negative ions. So the extraction optics can only extract one set of ions. So, so for example, we extract the positive ions and then flip the polarities and then extract the negative ions to get a complete picture of what's on the sample. So the, the mass analyzer here is a time of flight analyzer. So the ions are, the secondary ions are extracted at same kinetic energy and they are sent into the mass analyzer where the separation is based on their mass. So the lighter ions travel faster and the heavier ions travel later. So for every pulsed ion beam that hits the surface, a mass spectrum is generated. So this is pretty critical as we talk more about the useful nature of the TOF sims. So there's always confusion regarding TOF SIMS and SIMS. So there were a bunch of questions about that and I'll address that. But this talk will be focusing mostly on TOF SIMS. I mean, dynamic SIMS is another technique by itself. So in dynamic SIMS, I mean, the mass analyzers are typically magnetic sector or quadruple MS. So here a DC constant current beam, which is typically cesium source or an oxygen source comes in, bombards the surface and there is material removal and the data is typically elemental and it's a profiling tool. So you'll get a depth profile and you need to know what species you're tracking. Whereas with the TOF sims, which is also the static sims, you have a pulsed ion beam and the sources we typical are gallium, gold, bismuth cluster, so in a static mode, there's really no removal of material. The analysis is complete before like a significant damage is done to the surface. You get both elemental, inorganic and organic information. You, it's a survey analysis. You do not know what you're looking for. We can do organic depth profile with an argon cluster. The next set of questions is application-based. I mean, what are the uses of TOFSIM? So I have like a bunch of examples here to show the wide range of use of TOFSIM. So here are the three data types we generate with TOF. So first one is the spectral data. With the time of flight mass analyzer, one of the big advantages is the high mass resolution. So with this one, I mean, for example, I have, a mass range, which is from 58.9 to 59.1. So within 0.2, we have multiple ions here and we can ID each one of them. That's the beauty of the having a great uh, mass resolution there. Now, the second set of data that we generate is the imaging data. Since the beam is, is a submicron beam that is rasted across the surface, 
So we generate spectrum at each point the beam hits the surface. So for example, if we take a 100 micron by 100 micron analytical area, we generate distribution of these ions within that analytical area. For example, we here we show distribution of four ions. And the interesting one here is we have SO3 ion and HSO4 ion, which shows us that there are two sources of sulfates, sulfur sources here, because the distribution of SO3 is different from HSO4. And the last set of type of data that we generate is a depth profile. And here we have an organic depth profile of two organics represented by green and the red component. And here we have it as a function of depth. And we see that when the green signal goes down, the red one goes up, which kind of tells us there's a thin layer of the red material between this green. So here I have an example of a Tofsen spectra. Well, compared to LCMS or GCMS, where there is separation of the compound and then a mass spectrum is generated. In a top spectrum, it is complicated because if there are five compounds on your surface, all five are seen in the spectrum. So we need to know how do we separate them. So here I have a bunch of ions and I've marked them in red and another set marked in blue. So those are fingerprints for that particular compound. And then we look into our database and they are a match. The, the blue ones are matched to ergonox, which is an antioxidant. The red ions are a match because it's all these four sets of ions that tells us that it's a diisooctal phthalate. So it's so with the TOF experiment, it's very important to have either reference samples or else it matches with one of our reference library. Now next is an imaging capability. Here we have a pharmaceutical tablet cross-section and we are imaging, we are analyzing a 250 micron by 250 micron area shown by this red square. So the API here is the lansoprazole, which is an over-the-counter heartburn medication. So it has multiple components and it's important to know where exactly these components are present. The lansoprazole, which are shown by these two images, those are the two ions characteristic of lansoprazole. They show that they are present in the interiors of the analyzed area. So not on the exterior, there's nothing in this region. Whereas if you look at say magnesium, silicon, these are present mostly on the outside. Magnesium as a component which is present on the inside. Say for example, PEG is present in the entire analyzed area. And say cellulose, sucrose, they are more towards the inside of the sample. So this gives us an advantage of how, how is the distribution of different compounds within that analyzed area. So the next example I have is of an organic profiling. Here we have a polyolefin film. And on top of that, we have some contaminant, which is a slip agent, erucamate. So here's a mass spectrum of where we have the poly polyolefin ions, which are the hydrocarbon ions. And then we have the erucamate uh, molecular ion. So we profile through that material. Here we see that there's not much change in the C5H9, which is the polyolefin ion, but with the erucamid, as you see, with the spotted time, there's a drop in the signal that tells us that it's mostly present on the surface and goes away after, a, after some sputtering. So here's another way of showing it. Here we have an image of the surf, this is the as received surface where you see a domains of erucamid ion. And then after three seconds, things start reducing in strength. And at six seconds, signal is dropping fairly low. And at 12 seconds of spotted time, the signal is mostly gone except for a few islands, which were recommend rich islands. So the next big question is, can we quantify a TOF data? Tofsens is a semi-quantitative technique. As mentioned by Laurie, I mean, the analytical depth of 
the top experiment is one nanometer. So it's hard to produce standards for quantification because the surface, a, it's very hard to come up with a one nanometer layer. So here I have an example of a clean polystyrene. The topmost spectra here is of a clean polystyrene and the bottommost is polystyrene that was heavily contaminated with PDMS, polydimethyl silazine. So, so one way to, we say TOF is semi-quantitative is we can generate relative iron intensities. So for example, we have these two columns as the PDMS ions, and these two are for C6H5, C7, H7, which are the polystyrene ions. In a clean polystyrene, if you look at the C6H5, it's the highest of the four. And as you go down this column, polystyrene reduces to nothing, literally. And now let's look at one of the PDMS science. We can say it was the lowest in the clean polystyrene sample, but in a heavily contaminated one, that's where the PDMS ion was the highest. So this is kind of very useful to compare a good and a bad sample. What, what are the differences between them? Just to summarize the top strengths, we can do both elemental and molecular informations. It's a survey analysis, has great detection limit, small spot size, has unique organic profiling. We can analyze both set of materials, insulators, conductors. And in terms of the drawback, we need either a reference sample or a in our database spectra to be able to ID a compound. It has to be vacuum compatible. Wet samples are challenging, but doable at times. And the other uh, issue is it's too surface sensitive. I mean, that becomes a factor how the sample is handled or how they are shipped. So in terms of if you throw a sample into a plastic bag, the plastic sizes for the bag is gonna get onto the surface and gonna compromise that analysis. And for the next section, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Sasha Rudnyansky, who'll be talking about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Hello, uh, thank you, Sachin. And I will be talking about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS. And uh, here we can take a look again in the smart chart and um, see what uh, where XPS is located. Uh, it certainly has uh, not it, it's a little bit worse sensitivity than top sims, and uh, not as uh, big small uh, not as small uh, analytical uh, capabilities in terms of analytical area, but it's still. Uh, covers pretty wide range of uh, uh, both sensitivities and analytical area. Uh, as in the previous sections, a lot of uh, questions were of general nature. And uh, like, what is XPS? Can you uh, briefly describe the basics? And uh, what are the standard measurements? And so on. And if we can analyze small features, how do we find them? So let's talk about the basics first. And uh, we have a sample, uh, it's a solid state sample, uh, and we have a, a soft X rays, a soft X ray beam uh, fallen onto the surface. And uh, so X rays are uh, penetrated probably for a couple of microns and they generate photoelectrons. So it's based on photoelectron effect uh, for which Albert Einstein got his Nobel Prize, uh, not for relativity theory. Uh, and uh, so, there, uh, as I said, the um, photoelectrons are generated all the way up, uh, but the only those that are generated in the top uh, 100 or less angstroms uh, have the uh, possibility to get out of the surface and be detected by the analyzer. So, in addition to a uh, photoelectric effect, there are some other uh, secondary processes which we need to be aware of. So in, in this case, uh, the X-ray uh, photon beam 
kicks out a photoelectron from uh, the uh, atom and uh, creates an excited ion uh, where there is a hole. And excited ion uh, will have to uh, do go through a relaxation process. And there are a couple of ways it can happen. Uh, the first relaxation process uh, that a, an, another electron from high uh, energy orbital will fill in the hole and it will pass its energy to uh, another photon. And this process uh, called uh, X-ray fluorescence. Or uh, it can also give its energy to uh, a third electron and which, uh, with which you are familiar, already familiar, which is uh, Auger electron. And uh, that shows that we do have OJ peaks in XPS spectra as well, in addition to main photoelectron peaks. Uh, this is a schematic of the standard uh, spectrometer, and there are some major features which we need to be aware of. So this is a sample, of course, which we need to analyze. Uh, and uh, the X-rays are coming from here. This is the X-ray uh, source of the aluminum anode. And normally, uh, they're, they're, originally there were achromatic X-ray sources, but nowadays, most of the time, we're using monochromatic sources, which uh, uh, is basically we add a large quartz crystal uh, in order to cut out uh, Bremsstrahl radiation and uh, all secondary lines. And in this case of aluminum, we have only aluminum calf aligned, which is falling onto the uh, surface, and uh, the Photoelectrons that are generated and they, when once they come out of the surface, they are detected by the uh, energy analyzer. Uh, the figure that we are measuring in XPS uh, is kinetic energy of those electrons, but how, we are actually interested in binding energy uh, in order to determine uh, which elements are present on the surface. So the binding energy is uh, determined from uh, the known things uh, in the following simple formula. So this is the X-ray uh, excitation energy, the, uh, the uh, energy of the photons. Uh, this is the kinetic energy which we are measured by the spectrometer. And these are a couple of factors uh, where uh, um, this is the uh, work function of the spectrometer and this is the uh, net surface charge. Uh, this is specifically important when we are dealing with the uh, insulating samples. Um, and uh, XPS, uh, one of its strengths, which we'll talk about later, uh, is that ability of analyzes uh, insulating samples in addition to metallic samples. Uh, now I'll give a few examples. And this is the uh, analysis of silicon carbide. This is a survey spectrum, one of the uh, it's the first typical mode of uh, analysis uh, in XPS. And uh, now here uh, you have the high resolution spectrum of the silicon carbide, the silicon 2P line. And it, you can see if you overlay the silicon 2P line from the survey, the red one, and the blue one is the high resolution. You can see that they're located to the same binding energy, but uh, high resolution shows you that there are more than one. Uh, chemical components. In this case, it's silicon carbide, the main components, and the higher binding energy components of SiO2. Uh, this slide shows uh, uh, on the left hand side, it shows the uh, imaging uh, method uh, in XPS in uh, some modern instruments where you can actually locate uh, the feature even when it's very small. In this case, uh, this image has the uh, PET sheet and a small particle of smudge on it. And it, uh, we it did the analysis on both on this uh, particle and uh, in the control area, the blue area uh, of the sheet. And these are the survey spectra taken from uh, those two locations. As you can see, uh, the uh, location on the particle has very strong fluorine uh, and uh, while the blue spectrum from the control area has carbon and oxygen which is typical for PET and uh, corresponding high resolution spectra of carbon 1s also indicate that this is the uh, typical PET spectrum of carbon 1s 
and uh, the red spectrum has two components. One of them is hydrocarbon, and the, the other one is CF2. So you have a fluorocarbon contaminant particle on PET. And uh, this uh, uh, analysis was done using 20 micron uh, diameter uh, X-ray beam. Uh, now, the other questions that come up is how uh, we can analyze multi-layer coatings by XPS. And it's possible to analyze uh, to depth profile organic coatings. This slide shows uh, a depth profile of inorganic coating on the hard drive, a hard, uh, hard drive disk. And as you can see here, multiple layers and uh, the very top, uh, you see uh, carbon and fluorine, uh, which is corresponding to lubricant, uh, flora, uh, polyflora ether lubricant. And then uh, the narrow uh, carbon layer is DLC, uh, diamond-like carbon. Then the uh, cobalt, tantalum, and chromium layers. Uh, and uh, then in the end, it's nickel, uh, nickel phosphate substrate. This slide shows the uh, uh, depth profile of organic coating. It's a 50-50 it's PLG uh, uh, coating uh, deposited on stainless steel. Uh, instead of using the uh, monatomic uh, argon beam, we use a C60 beam. Another option may be uh, to use a uh, uh, <sighs> Argon cluster uh, uh, beam. That's the two options to uh, profile uh, organic coatings in uh, XPS. So in this case, we use C60 beam, and uh, the high resolution spectra on the right hand side were taken from different uh, depths in, in this profile. So the, uh, the first two spectra here on top were taken from the very surface and somewhere in the middle. And as you can see, uh, they are identical. And then later spectra, uh, they change as we get closer to the interface with stainless steel. And at the very end, this green spectrum uh, is a spectrum of carbide, which is kind of an artifact that uh, when uh, you use C60 beam to spot a metals, uh, it grows some carbide. So we know we reached the uh, metal substrate in this case. And uh, now, uh, other sets of questions, is it uh, possible to analyze uh, some materials that are not exactly vacuum compatible? And uh, can you give some examples of the uh, application? So there is a way to uh, analyze uh, not vacuum compatible samples, and that's using cold stage. So what we do is we, the samples are being cooled, essentially frozen, in the interchamber once they introduce from uh, atmospheric uh, ambience, and then they continue to be frozen uh, on the analytical stage in the analytical chamber of the instrument. And the temperature we typically reach is about uh, minus 80 to uh, 100 centigrade or when the samples are cooled. Uh, there are several applications of uh, this approach. Uh, one of them is uh, actually is not, uh, uh, one of them is, uh, I'm sorry, one of them is uh, when we we may use this cold stage cooling of the sample when the uh, surface uh, uh, the surface has some changes when in, uh, introduced to uh, UHV, for example, uh, some volatile components, or uh, there may be some reconstruction or segregation of the elements from buried layers. Uh, also, um, so this could be controlled or at least slowed down by the uh, freezing the sample during the analysis. Also, uh, some samples uh, exhibit damages from the analysis, uh, from the x-rays and from uh, other radiations. And uh, these damages can also be uh, controlled by the, uh, and slowed down by the uh, cooling of the uh, sample. Uh, and additionally, finally, we can analyze some samples with moisture, like pieces of food uh, and uh, plain liquids. Uh, here is an example of cold stage analysis of one of the very common applications is the analysis of contact lenses. So here you have carbon spectrum 
from a, a frozen contact lens. And here, the carbon spectrum from uh, the same contact lens was, uh, or similar contact lens was introduced in vacuum without cooling. And as you can see, they have the same peaks. Uh, however, especially this uh, middle peak, which is a CO, uh, is much stronger uh, in case of cooling. So we know that there is a component that has CO which uh, is volatile uh, on the surface of the lens. And the table is obtained from this, those curve fits, uh, shows you that indeed the CO component is much stronger in the uh, frozen uh, surface uh, uh, as compared to that of the uh, surface uh, analyzed at room temperature. Uh, in summary, uh, there are a few uh, strengths and uh, limitations which we need to mention. Uh, so uh, the strengths of XPS are that it can analyze uh, all elements except hydrogen and helium and provide elemental uh, composition. Uh, and it could also provide chemical states like uh, oxidation state of metal or uh, of, uh, organic functional groups. Uh, it, uh, the analysis is quantitative and uh, it can analyze, uh, as I mentioned earlier, insulating samples. And as you can see, we have a few examples of polymers. Uh, uh, limitations of the technique is that its uh, detection limits are uh, typically between 500 ppm and 5000 ppm. Uh, the smallest analytical area is uh, about 10 micron uh, and limited organic information, uh, which could be obtained. We, as I said, we can get information about functional groups, but not specific compounds like for example, tough sims, and it's a UHV technique. So uh, we, uh, in case we have a sample uh, with a smaller feature than uh, 10 micron, we can use it uh, and move it on from XPS to OG. Uh, if we need more details about uh, organic chemistry of the surface, we can also apply tough sims. And in case of UHV, uh, not compatible sample, we can actually, actually remedy it with the cold state analysis. Uh, now I uh, give microphone uh, to Lori Lavagna, uh, and uh, she will talk about some other things. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, we have a couple of charts now contrasting and comparing information obtained and specs between the three analytical techniques we talked about today and some similar techniques. So here it's got TOF, XPS, OJ comparing with dynamic SIMS or SIMS, SEM, EDX, and FTAR and what type of information they can have. Um, and the next chart goes into quite a bit more detail uh, with the specs and comparisons between each of the three. So these two charts will be available in the recording that you'll get via email. And these should address some of the questions that were asked about comparing what information is available from each technique. Uh, so now we've got some time here that we can take some of the questions submitted today. So let's do the first question for Sa Chen. And it's a Toff Sims question. Can the same instrument instrument provide first TOF SIMS with detail from only the surface subsurface and then basically turn the knob and do a dynamic SIMS to collect uh, data more from the bulk? Yeah, I mean, uh, with the TOF instruments, I mean, it depends on what kind of ion guns are available on the system. Say, for example, if a TOF system had Oxygen cesium sources, you can profile in organic materials. And if it had an argon cluster, you can use that to profile organic surface. Please okay. note that uh, uh, the only distinction will be there'll be a sputter beam coming in and sputtering the surface, and then the analytical beam comes and probes the surface to what's there. So it's kind of a, what do you call, it's not a truly dynamic profiling, it's kind of a staggered profiling where we are pro taking on material, looking at what's underneath that. Whereas in a dynamic sense, it's a continuous removal of material and analysis of that material. That's the main difference between a dynamic sense and a TOF sense. 
profile. So what you're mentioning is really how OJ and XPS do profi or profiles also. They take data, then sputter, then take yeah. data, alternating. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, there are a number of questions that I think, um, I'll give this to Jurgen about addressing confidence intervals, calibration for accurate results, uh, accurate results comparing between samples. So kind of accuracy versus precision. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, I think I will answer this with respect to OJ, but a similar concept to apply to, um, to XPS. So accuracy refers to how close a measured value is to the true value. And um, I think when it comes to accuracy, we should distinguish between a surface and a bulk measurement. In a, in a bulk measurement, for example, if you want to measure the composition of a thin film, we'd run a profile, we measure the intensities, apply sensitivity factors, and get the concentrations. So the main source of inaccuracy there are the sensitivity factors. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. Uh, if they're not, we could still measure our own sensitivity factors on reference samples, and then the accuracy will be very high, maybe within a few percent. Now, surfaces or surface is a completely different beast because a lot of the assumptions and requirements that go into quantification may not apply to a surface. Uh, they're never really um, smooth and uniform and homogeneous. Um, but I think what's more important is, is that the term surface is not really well defined. Uh, for one person, it might be the top monolayer. For another person, it might be a top micron. On top of that, each technique has a different sampling depth. And even within each technique, you might have different sampling depths for the different elements. So um, you might ask, well, it does do absolute numbers measured on the surface make any sense at all? And I would say yes, because um, accuracy is usually required when we want to verify a material specification. For example, um, how much carbon is allowed on the surface of um, an electropolished stainless steel. And the way this problem with all the uncertainties is solved is by making basically the measurement part of the specification. So uh, requiring, let's say for example, that electropolished stainless steel cannot have more than 30 angstroms of, uh, sorry, 30 atomic percent of carbon does not make any sense at all. But by embedding the technique into that, by saying, well, it cannot have more than 30% carbon as measured by XPS and maybe even under certain conditions, um, that puts basically then meaning in that, in that number uh, that we're measuring. And somebody at some point would have to decide what that number actually is uh, in, in the specification. Now, as far as precision is concerned, precision refers to uh, reproducibility. If I make the same measurement over and over again, uh, am I going to get the same number? And um, the precision of these techniques is actually very high. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that when we measure concentrations, we're actually measuring intensity ratios and ratios can be measured very reproducibly. Um, the, um, in, in, in fact, um, what we actually do on a weekly basis is we measure intensity ratios on a reference sample. And um, that ratio is only uh, allowed to vary within a certain amount. And if it goes out of bounds, then we're actually not even allowed to use that instrument for analysis. So that ensures that whenever we make a, a, a measurement that, re that requires reproducibility, we work with an instrument that can provide that. Um, if, you, if you ask, well, what are, what are the numbers, right? Um, I think for the OJ, it's like 20%. So the ratio cannot vary by more than 20%. But it does not mean that if you make repetitive measurements that they will scatter by 20%. It means that's when the alarm bells go off. Uh, if you look at the medium to long-term variation, it's maybe more like 10%. If you make a uh, side-by-side -side comparison, it's maybe just a few percent. And uh, honestly, I think the, the concept of precision is actually much more important than accuracy because most of the type of analyses that we would do are comparative in nature. So you would compare good versus bad or, uh, or, or old uh, method versus new method. And that really requires uh, a high precision and, and that's what these uh, techniques can provide. Thank you, Jurgen. 
Uh, let's take an XPS question next here for Sasha. Is depth profiling available on all XPS machines or is it just a feature on some? To the best of my knowledge, most, most, or probably all modern XPS instruments have at least argon, uh, monatomic argon ion beam and ion gun, so you can do the profiles of uh, inorganic materials. Uh, as far as uh, C60 guns or argon cluster guns, uh, they are some of the instruments are equipped with them, but uh, many are not. So that's you really need to look for a specific instrument if you have to do organic profiles. And this is just a relatively new thing. Uh, we were not be able to do organic profiling until maybe 15 or so years ago. All right, thank you, Sasha. Uh, this next one is really probably for all of you, but uh, let's start with Sachin. So it's how to handle insulating samples uh, for your technique. So starting with TOF. So with TOF, I mean, uh, because the way the samples are mounted is they're mounted under masks. So we take the smallest mask window and put it on an insulating sample. That helps us dissipate the charge buildup. Only a small portion of the sample is exposed to the beam then. That helps us dissipate the charge buildup. And you're good? Um, yeah, I think OG probably has the, the most problems with, uh, with insulating samples. And OG has a little bit of reputation of not being good for insulators, but that's not really true because there is a really a lot of cases where it can be dealt with. So if, if we're looking at an insulating thin film, that often works just fine as long as the thickness of the film is not too large. Let's say a few thousand angstroms should be fine. You might be able to get away with a micron. Um, if the film is thicker than that, um, then it behaves like a bulk insulator. And um, with bulk insulators, we could play tricks with uh, increasing the tilt angle and lowering, lowering the beam voltage, for example. And if, if the surface is smooth enough, that should work in most cases. Um, we can always coat a sample with a conductive layer, um, even though that's a little tricky because, I mean, we're so surface sensitive. So it has to be just the right thickness and there's always a risk of um, pulling in some uh, oxygen and carbon in, in the deposition process. And so it's a little tricky. It's more like a last resort kind of approach, I would say. Um, then the, um, the ion guns we have on the OJs, they're actually capable of being run in the neutralizer mode uh, where, the, where the surface is flooded with low energy ions. Um, and there are some data out there where that was used for, um, for bulk in large bulk insulators. But um, I think in most cases, this will not work. Uh, however, neutralizer works really well in cases where we're looking at a conductive grounded feature that's surrounded by an insulator, typically, for example, a bond pad. Um, and the, the neutralizer takes care of the charging of uh, the dielectric around the bond pad. Uh, and that works really well for oxides, nitrites, uh, organics are a little different. So if it is, if the material around the pad is uh, a polyamide, um, a polyamide, for example. Uh, we've come up with ways of dealing with that too uh, by using the in-situ focused ion beam to basically graphitize the organic and that takes care of a lot of the problems. Um, and finally, you could have a situation where you're actually looking at a conductive surface that's not electrically connected to ground. Uh, again, might be a bond pad that's the, where the internal circuitry is not connected. And um, they can always run a bead of, um, um, of silver paint up to the bond pad, uh, which could be a little messy and it's, um, it requires a steady hand. Um, so not for people that drink a lot of coffee. So I'm out on that one, uh, but there's always to do that too. So for example, we can use um, the focused ion beam that we have on the tool to drill a hole through the air that we're analyzing down to a deeper layer that's grounded. And by doing that, for example, and ground um, uh, the bond pad. So, so there are varieties of uh, different techniques and sometimes we run a situation which is nothing works, but uh, it happens actually fairly rarely that we'd have to turn a sample away because none of these methods uh, work. Okay, and Sasha for XPS? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, as Sachin mentioned, we do cover insulating samples with masks oftentimes. And in addition, we have uh, uh, what we call neutralizers. So there is electron neutralizer, which is low energy, uh, low current electron beam, electron gun. Uh, and also we have an ion gun, which is a normal argon ion gun, which we use in the neutralization mode. Again, low uh, low energy, low current. So mm, in most for most uh, insulators, this works just great. Uh, there are some cases like uh, very sensitive insulators, like again I mentioned early in my presentation, the uh, lubricants. Uh, these may be destroyed by even those uh, low energy, low current ion beam, uh, which we use for neutralization. So in that case, we have to turn it off. And only use the electron uh, beam to neutralize. And but in most cases, uh, I don't remember in the past 20 years where I would have a neutralize, uh, have an insulator which I won't be able to run because of charging. Okay, thank you, Sasha. So that concludes the time uh, that we have today to answer the questions. But we will follow up with all the questions that everybody asked and get a response to you shortly. Uh, so our last um, overview slide here is why choose Eurofins EAG? And there's a number of reasons, but it's really important to state right at the top that client confidentiality is core to our business. So all of our processes, procedures, data storage protocols put client confidentiality first. And we're a global leader for materials testing services with a broad range of instruments and expertise that leave us poised to take on even the most challenging materials and engineering related issues. And also at EAG, we have a number of certifications, accreditations, licenses, um, here listing ISO 9001 and 17025 uh, to support our clients' quality needs. So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and I'll turn it to Rena for some final comments. Thank you to all of our experts for this robust discussion and presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today's event. Um, as Lori mentioned, if we didn't get to your questions today, we will be following up with you soon. If you have any other questions, please send in your questions to the email address on the screen. That's customer service at eurofinseag.com. Also wanted to mention that I've added a few links to our resources in the chat window along with a registration link to next week's Ask the Expert focusing on ATE testing. Please, please check those out. And as for the Ask the Expert on FTIR, Raman, and GCMS scheduled for June 28th, the registration page will be posted soon, so please check back for details. Um, again, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate your feedback. And on behalf of Eurofins EAG Laboratories and our experts, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.